So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the nature of mythic time in Norse mythology, but um, a lot of things I'm going to mention here um, can also be applied to other uh, mythologies as well. So religions of the world um, experience and encode time in various ways. Uh, we can have a linear progression. Um, we can have a never ending set of cycles um, as a process of degeneration and then resurrection and so forth. Um, of course, we are used to a linear system um, since this characterizes our Christian tradition. Um, so we see the creation of world through um, um, a long present leading to um, our time and then the day of judgment, the end of history. So um, there is no cyclical element in, um, in this. Um, our science also gives us um, increasing detail regarding the origin of the entire um, universe. So now we know that uh, we live in the aftermath of the Big Bang and uh, the origin of our uh, cosmic system. And um, we do know that in due course, um, this um, um, cosmos of ours, at least the way we experience it nowadays, is also going to end. In a cyclical system, however, this um, uh, linear progression will repeat itself um, and um, so each end is followed by a new beginning. Um, in Scandinavian mythology, um, we do encounter special challenges um, when we are dealing with um, um, this um, way of interpreting things um, because um, the notion of time and um, uh, the notion of history um, would have been a little different. However, most of the sources we have were recorded by um, Christians. This is especially uh, so when we talk about Snorri Sturluson, yeah, who wrote the uh, Snorra Edda in the 13th um, century, containing um, most details and also coherent stories about uh, Scandinavian um, uh, mythology. Um, we also must not forget, forget that uh, Snorri was also a historian, so not only a Christian, um, and for example, his history of the Norwegian kings was arranged chronologically. Um, so we are going to find throughout his work um, this uh, linear progression um, specific to our uh, worldview, so at least after we became uh, Christians. Um, but there are hints at another um, worldview. We find that in um, uh, the poem uh, Voluspor. Um, more, uh, most often, um, this is part um, of the poetic Edda, written also in the 13th century, but um, most poems are of much older date and they circulated orally for a long time. Um, and um, yeah, this uh, is late paganism, um, might have also been Christian influence. Um, however, um, such a poem does show traces of a rather cyclic arrangement of uh, time, although the cyclic and linear um, arrangements um, do tend to mix up uh, here as well in the source as well. Um, so it's um, noteworthy that uh, various myths um, uh, present contradictions of this um, whole uh, chronology and um, overall such contradictions are characteristic of myths. Um, myths uh, have their own rules, they function after their own logic. Um, and with Scandinavian mythology, at least in the way it is presented to us by these two sources, the Poetic and Prose Edda, um, these um, uh, rules of myth uh, appear to suggest a pretty consistent order of events with some kind of, um, some kind of narrative. However, on the other um, hand, um, we don't need to always um, regard the events happening in this mythology as, um, you know, a whole uh, coherent uh, unity which can be fit into a very precise um, scheme. References. A reference, we have the Norns, um, which, uh, whose names derive from uh, the verb to become, verda, so we have ur verdandien skuld, um, meaning what became, so what happened, uh, the becoming or the happening, and what um, is to be or what will, uh, what will happen. And um, 
I also found uh, found it interesting that um, there are some authors, uh, for example, John Lindo, who tried to make um, a broader distinction. Um, so going a little past um, these denominations uh, referring to time. So um, if we are to further divide um, the Norse uh, mythological time, we would have, for example, the distant past um, involving the period before the creation of the universe. So when we had um, um, the void Genunga gap um, from where um, the whole world was uh, created, so kind of like a void of potential, um, and then the mysterious waters from which life was to emerge, and um, creatures such as Ymir, uh, the primordial uh, giant, the hermaphroditic uh, generation uh, of um, the races of uh, giants. And then we have uh, Bur, the first of uh, gods, who also existed in this time. Um, then if you want to move a little closer to the present, we are going to find the near past. So we can speak of the near past. This would include the creation of cosmos um, from um, uh, the body of Ymir, actually, so from this hermaphroditic uh, creature. Um, and uh, the uh, prerequisite for forming this cosmos whatsoever was the killing of this giant by the sons of Bur. Um, and uh, then um, we uh, get the two major groups of uh, gods um, yeah, engaging uh, in, um, uh, in combat all the time afterwards. So um, yeah, persistent in this state of enmity, I mean the gods and the giants. Um, yeah, and um, we can also add here the creation of the races of dwarfs and um, humans, for example, and also the um, incorporation of the Vanir gods, uh, so the gods of um, uh, fertility, rather, into um, the family of the Asir, um, or at least their encounter with them um, as, um, uh, as events of the near past as well. Um, so once we have this um, um, overall idea about what the world, the mythological world looks, um, as we do in um, uh, many other mythologies, um, we can refer a little to the mythological uh, presence, present, um, which is not a very uh, well-defined um, present in the sense that uh, we are going to find a lot of um, possible chronologies regarding when what um, happened um, and um, it doesn't really matter whether a given myth um, occurs after or before some other myth um, yeah well sometimes certain events tend to precede or follow others but there is not um, really a coherent chronology if you um, if you will um, yeah, so for example, we have in Skoldska Parmol, written by Snorri, so it's um, um, the um, art of poetry, um, where we have this episode with the gods trying to appease the giantess Skadi for killing, for the killing of her father, Tjatsi. Uh, they offer her um, the possibility to choose a husband among the gods, and they let her select uh, this husband based on her observing um, just the lower legs, and she chooses um, the legs of whom uh, she thinks is Baldur, but she ends up with another god with um, uh, Njort. Um, so according to this narrative, um, the marriage um, of this god, this fertility god Njord, would precede uh, the death of Baldur. Um, on the other hand, um, the goddess Freus managed, um, the god, sorry, Freus managed to uh, giantess Gerd, appears to have followed Baldur's death um, in the poem uh, Skirnismol, for example, when um, uh, uh, Skirnir offers the giantess the ring that was burnt with the son of um, Odin. So in this case, Baldur must already be, uh, be dead. And maybe we can assume that Snorri had this sequence of events in mind when he wrote um, this, um, um, this um, uh, event uh, in uh, the catalogue catalog of gods where he says that Njord um, is married to Skadi, but he does not say that Freud is married to um, Gerth. Um, so I'm guessing that um, in Snorri's mind, Baldr was um, already dead when the gods uh, visited uh, the um, host 
um, the god uh, acting as a host, um, Agir, um, at the, his feast at the beginning of this treaty of poetry, because Gerd is included in the guest list. Um, so yeah, it's um, um, it's hard to tell uh, the exact uh, chronology of these um, uh, of these events. Um, they're very relative, we can say. Um, and uh, another relative um, event uh, or relatively early event would be the acquisition of the meat of um, poetry, for example. So the meat was um, in the first place created as a result of the hostilities between these two families of gods, the Asir and the Vanir. Um, it is a sign of um, the uh, a mixing of the two groups and um, it is one of Odin's most powerful weapons in um, his struggle with the giants with the Jotnar. Um, and um, the construction of the wall around the stronghold of the gods um, as well told also by Snorri uh, in the first part of his uh, Snorra Edda in Gulva Ginning um, is a story to be assigned to the early mythological present. Um, it explains basically how um, a wall was built around uh, Valhol, yeah, so the um, um, one of the residences of um, um, of the gods and the places where warriors went after they um, they died. Uh, it also tells how Sleipnir, who was Odin's eight-legged horse, was uh, created. Uh, so again, a strict chronological uh, consistency consistency is lacking because. Um, the acquisition of the Mead of Poetry, the story about it, implies the existence uh, of the wall uh, because the gods put the kettles for it in the enclosure. But in the uh, but the incorporation of the Asir and the Vanir, um, which is actually the precondition for the existence of, of this Mead, occurred in the near uh, past. Um, yeah, overall, we can say that Odin's myths um, tend towards the early part of the mythic present. Yeah, so we mentioned before, Mead of Poetry, War and Peace with the other family of the gods, with the Vanir, um, also the um, uh, Blood Brotherhood with uh, Loki, uh, and what um, uh, the Asir gods do uh, and punish, how they punish Loki's um, uh, children. Um, and of course, there is also Odin's um, self-sacrifice um, which uh, gained him um, a lot of the wisdom he will uh, use later on also in the mythological um, present. Um, other events occur um, fairly late in the mythological present. Um, the bad death of Baldur, I will go into that a little bit um, as well. So as the first death among the gods, it changes basically the terms of the game. So even if it does not make Ragnarok, uh, so the end of the gods, the apocalypse of the gods uh, inevitable, it makes um, it made it possible because um, now um, the death of any other god is a possibility. Um, and um, if we follow his story in uh, Snorri's uh, Edda, we are going to see that his strategy of swearing this blood brotherhood with Loki uh, has failed because Loki is the one who brings about Baldur's death. Um, and the gods bind Loki, um, like his sons, the wolf Fenrir, the uh, serpent Midgard, and he awaits Ragnarok, so the, the end of the world, as the final step uh, in this uh, mythology. Um, so a lot of these events in the mythic present, they look forward to Ragnarok and um, yeah, as a uh, um, consequence of these uh, failures, the failed oath, for example, and um, the resulting uh, actions such as the binding of the evil creatures, uh, which brings us to the, la to the um, um, last point of this uh, cyclical time, yeah, so the future. Um, we could also divide the future in two stages, the near future, uh, which is Ragnarok. Um, yeah, so when the power of the gods uh, over the giants will be uh, reversed. Yeah, so uh, if you read the Poetic Edda or the Prose Edda, you remember that um, the giant Surt, the fire giant, will lead the forces of chaos against uh, the gods who will fall one by one. And also time will be um, abolished, let's say, because the sun and the moon uh, are swallowed and the heavens are destroyed and basically uh, the whole cosmos will be consumed by flames and water. So 
each of the major gods uh, will die in individual combat, but at least Odin gets to be avenged by his son Vidar, and this vengeance constitutes um, the path to the distant future. Uh, this is the time after Ragnarok when the second generation of gods will um, uh, dominate the renewed um, earth. And this new paradise is going to be green and fertile and we no longer have... Uh Um, so, um, we could notice from this overall uh, chronology of Scandinavian mythology, it is quite, that it is quite symmetrical. Um, so, we began with um, the void and we ended up with um, um, the destruction. Um, and in the distant uh, past, there was no uh, world, but in the distant future, there is a green world. And um, this whole course of mythology has um, led to a better world overall. So, of course, we um, should ask ourselves the question, is this a sign of a cyclical uh, time? Um, there are some hints at this. Um, that the cyclical notion was at work, um, that the cosmos was reformed on multiple occasions. However, we cannot say for sure if this exact same pattern um, described by these uh, two sources, the Prose and Poetic Edda, uh, will repeat itself um, to infinity. So if, if, it, uh, if we have the myth of the eternal return, um, this is rather under uh, under debate, I would say. Um, um, and yeah, we do have these underlying uh, traces of cycling time, but at the same time, we can also notice um, a linear progression in the sense that all these events I mentioned before, they are leading to, um, to a very uh, concrete, um, well-defined outcome, which is um, um, Ragnar. Uh, Ragnarok. Um, and complicating this uh, problem um, is a relationship between time and space, um, about which um, researchers such as Margaret Clunis Ross discusses, for example. Um, and um, this has to do with um, the fact that we might distinguish between the vertical form of time, um, which manifests itself in the form of the world tree linking heaven and um, yeah, the underlying world, um, and then the uh, horizontal perception of time, which has to do with um, you know uh, Earth in general, where we have these realms, the realms of the gods, um, um, Oscar the and Myth the realm of people, and then um, Jotunheimer, uh, the realm of, um, of giants. Um, and there is the problem here of um, yeah, whether these axes uh, are reversible or irreversible. Um, and um, the vertical axis, yeah, so the, um, the tree um, view of the world uh, seem to have some cyclical uh, some cyclical aspects yeah and this also in the sense of uh, resurrection um, and um, the horizontal aspect of um, time um, yeah we can interpret it in um, in both ways so um, both as eschatological so irreversible irreversible leading to a certain point um, or um, in the sense that uh, even the events on the horizontal axis, most of them uh, part of the mythical present, um, uh, they can either contribute directly to this, uh, this outcome of Ragnarok or they could just uh, be thought of as uh, suspended in this um, time, in this mythical uh, time with no precise the last problem of this mythology, uh, what complicates it is, um, first of all, uh, that the entire system is um, um, implicit in any of its uh, details. Um, 
in the sense that um, all these myths can be found as uh, metaphors, the so-called Kenningar in um, poems, um, in skaldic poems, for example, from the pagan period. And um, these mythological references do not need any kind of chronology, uh, but somehow they imply um, that everything is happening at the uh, same time, um, at least for the audience. Um, and the second problem is a linguistic one, um, which has to do with the fact um, that um, some verbs can be translated um, or understood either in the present tense or in the future tense. Um, it also has to do with um, um, some differences um, uh, in the manuscripts uh, between present and past tense, for example, uh, where you only have uh, one vowel making the difference or something like that. So this uh, linguist, these linguistic facts complicate uh, our understanding of, um, um, of texts. So in Volspo, for example, the um, Sirius, the prophetess who speaks in the poem, um, she says in one manuscript that she saw some events connected with the apocalypse. Um, but then in, um, in a future stanza, she begins to use uh, the present uh, tense. So we ask ourselves the question, is, um, is she located somewhere towards the beginning of Ragnarok or not? Um, all right, and last but not least, um, we should also mention that for the Christians of the Scandinavian Middle Ages, um, including the authors uh, of, these, um, uh, of these writings and poems and so on, such as Snorri himself, um, the gods would have had their place in historical time by now. Um, Snorri also tries to personify them, uh, to humorize them, so to, to make them uh, appear as uh, real uh, kings, for example. Um, and uh, through their presence, um, you know, uh, somehow uh, Icelanders, at least, they try to make a connection to uh, to the past. So, uh, yeah, Snoddy, for example, says that they would have left, uh, the gods would have left their homeland um, at some point during the Roman Empire, uh, so around 100 BC. E, and um, uh, then we have um, not only Snorri, but also Saxo Grammaticus, for example, who associate the legendary King Frothi, uh, the grandson of uh, the god Froy, according to Snorri, um, with the peace that happened um, when uh, Jesus Christ was on, uh, on earth. And um, yeah, then the uh, translated lives of the saints, they put the Norse gods uh, in place of Jupiter, Mars, Diana, and other Roman gods in the time and space of early uh, Christianity. So it is possible and I think likely that um, Ragnarok, for example, yes, yeah, so the, um, the apocalypse, uh, the Norse apocalypse was seen at least by a part of Christians um, as, um, let's say, the uh, demise of not only uh, the pre-Christian gods, the pagan gods, but uh, also of the belief in them and the worship of them. And their day would have preceded the day of, um, of Jesus Christ. And um, yeah, it had a well-deserved end. And such an element would explain why we have um, both this uh, a hint at the linear uh, structure of time characteristic of um, our Christian worldview and the uh, rather pre-Christian cyclical structure of time that it all uh, combined. All right, I hope uh, you found it uh, at least a little bit interesting or a few aspects of what I've uh, told you here. And if you want to hear me talk about more topics, similar topics, um, or if you rather want to hear me um, compare some uh, vocabulary items in different uh, languages, leave me a comment and uh, I will be waiting for your suggestions. Thank you very much for hearing me and uh, keep healthy, take care, all the best.